Hi everyone, this is Jessica Spear. I'm a research scientist at MRL. I work in the scanning probe microscopy core. And today we're going to look at how to use our Puma on a sample in air. So first let's go ahead and open up the software. Okay. So the first thing it's gonna ask you to do is do you wanna home the stage? So usually we'll say yes. Okay, so the next thing I want to show you to do is to come up here and click on select camera. This will turn the camera off in the software and that's because we want to come down here and you see I have some icons pinned to the taskbar. Let's open up the camera window. This software here is going to allow us to control the settings of our webcam. All right, so first we're gonna come here and name our experiment. So let's choose calibration and make sure it's going into a folder on the computer that's your folder. So here we'll be doing training demo. I'm gonna choose today's date and just select the folder. It will make a new subfolder with the calibration name. So you don't have to worry every time you rename um, the file here it'll make a new folder. Alright so the next thing we want to do is come up here and go across the top and check our profile is set to the defaults. If you want a different indentation profile you can just change any of these to be whatever amount of time per segment or displacement that you want. 10,000 is the max so we'll just leave it at that for now. Then we're going to configure the probe. So this depends on whichever type of probe you're using. So on the front of the box of the tip that you have, it will give you a specific spring constant as well as a specific tip radius. So input those here and then save. Next, click on the options and check that things are set how you want. So if you're going to use the matrix, check that your matrix settings are raising your tip high enough that it won't crash as it moves in the X or Y direction across the surface. This also tells you after you do an automated approach, how far above the surface should, I should the software lift the probe after it finds the surface. And then down here, this is how much you want to fit the data, how much percentage of that curve you want to fit with the Hertz model. The cal calibration depth is set to 10,000, that's the max. Make sure it's set to at least the amount that you plan on indenting. If not, just leave it at the max if you're not sure. Okay, so to get ready to do a calibration, first we're going to use a silicon sample. So I'm going to place that on the stage below the tip. And then I'm going to lower the gray knobs. To bring the tip close to the surface. And you can see that it's blurry and that's why we need to use the settings here. So if you click on this button, it'll open the settings. We go to advanced the camera control tab and uncheck autofocus and then use the slider to bring the tip into a good focus. You can also use the zoom to help you out if you want. Okay, so now you can see the tip is still pretty high up above the silicon and you can see I put the silicon into a petri dish it's not necessary for your samples in air. I've done this because I can use this sample for experiments in air, or if I'm gonna do an experiment in liquid, I can also just add the fluid and just keep the same reference standard. Okay, so the next thing we wanna do is lower the probe close to the surface. So we'll come over here and use these stage controls. So this is a little map showing us where the tip is relative to the total size of the stage. Here you have X, Y in the buttons. This will move the stage 
in either direction and it will travel however far you type into this box. Similarly, the Z also raises and lowers the probe. So this is the one we're gonna use first. Since we are pretty high up above it, the surface of the sample, we can start with a thousand and feel pretty safe that we won't crash. But we'll keep an eye here. And if I think I'm gonna crash because I set the number too far, we can hit stop. So let's go down again. Okay, so I don't think we could travel another thousand without crashing. So the closer you get, be safe and lower the travel distance. Okay. So here you can see the reflection of the tip and the actual tip are pretty close. So I think that's a good distance to leave for the instrument to do an automated approach. Okay, so to do that, we have some controls here. So usually we'll use this fine surface button to automatically detect the surface and it will mark where the surface is and set that here. Okay. This is for a manual approach, so if you're going to lower it a little bit at a time until you decide you found the surface, then you can set or clear the surface into the software. The button that we're interested in now is this calibration. So what we're gonna do is perform a wavelength scan. We want to calibrate the, the signal coming through the fiber optic before we begin any indentations. And this has to be done in the same medium that you're gonna be performing the experiment in. And you can see the signal here. Okay, it's finished and everything looks good. So now we'll move to the next step. So we'll go back to calibration and this time we're gonna use the fine surface, but this button does it a little different. It's actually going to approach the surface and then leave the tip in contact with the surface. And that's because we want it to be in contact when we do the actual calibration. All right, so once it's finished, you'll hear the beeping stop and it'll also show you the steps have quit moving here. So now we can click calibrate, make sure it's in contact with a stiff surface. So silicon is an infinitely stiff surface compared to the bending of our cantilever, so that's perfectly fine. Okay, so once the calibration is complete, it's gonna give you a geo factor. Make sure this number is less than two and seems reasonable. If it is, then we'll use the new factor. What we're gonna do now is perform an indent to check that the calibration was successful. So here the green and blue lines correspond to the cantilever bending and probe displacement. We wanna make sure they have a nice overlap and they look pretty good, so the calibration is done. What we wanna do now is bring the tip back up to its zero position. So we'll click Z up. And this allows us to get ready to measure our sample. So the calibrations are quick and easy and they're already done. I'm gonna raise the tip up now and put a sample on the stage. This is a lipid sample on a piece of silicon wafer and what I'm gonna do is lower the tip close to the surface. I've propped it up on some glass slides 
So we don't need to lower the gray knobs all the way to the max. So we'll stop about here. Okay, so first, before we forget, let's change the file name to something representative of what you're measuring. Um, this is especially important if you have multiple samples because you may get confused which force groups belong to which samples, so don't forget this step. So we'll bring the tip close to the surface. And then when we're ready, we'll go to find surface. You can see it's taking small steps, approaching the surface cautiously. And you can change that in the options as well. And you see this change in voltage here means we found our surface and you can see the steps have stopped moving. So now we're ready to perform an indent on our sample. And here you can see a force curve. It starts out of contact, indents onto the sample, and then retracts. And you can see here the lipid has quite a bit of adhesion to our probe, which isn't ideal, but for this case, it's okay. You see this red line here. This is the fit to the curve. And you can see it's estimating the Young's modulus down here. So after this, you can do a couple of things. You can raise the tip up, and then you can move into a different direction to find a fresh spot to do another indent. If you wanna do many indents without having to do it manually, you can use a grid. You can choose a number of data points. So this might actually be quite a lot. It will take a long time. So maybe we'll do something smaller. And then you choose the distance between these data points. And you can see over here on the map, you can see my grid here. Because we're going to move so far between the data points, one, that's good because then the, the spot won't overlap with the next indent. You can choose use XY to make sure the grid starts where the probe already is. And then come here to options and make sure that your probe is being raised high enough that when it moves 500 in the X direction, it does not crash into any part of your sample. And this could be due to the sample has some kind of tilt to it. It could be that it's rough or uneven. And so you basically want to clear anything that could crash, especially because you're letting the instrument do this in an automated fashion. Okay, so after you are finished with all of the indents that you are interested in performing, you can raise the tip up and then what we can do is open the Puma data viewer and I'll show you how to do some basic data processing. So first you'll choose your folder so we saved ours in this folder here and then we can choose which one of these that we just took a data on. You can see the curve here. The fit of the curve is 85%. We can change that to something smaller, depending on how much of the curve you think needs to be fit. You can see 30, we'll stop about here. And you can decide which fit looks the best. Make sure you're choosing the Hertz model. And then you can see it's inputting the parameters stored in the software. So if you forgot to do that, definitely fix that here. And then you can see the estimation of your module, effective Young's modulus here. These files are already saved for you. So you can see here, it saves an image of the indentation, as well as it saves the text file. So you can plot this force curve in any other program. And if you don't need a figure of this, then you can just write down this number and then scroll through 
the next force curve one at a time until you are finished. Okay, so that concludes how to use the software for a sample in air.